In this video, we're going to discuss business architecture from the perspective of an enterprise architect or a cloud architect, or even an AWS solutions architect or Azure architect or any architect for that matter. Now we're going to talk about business architecture because it's one of the most critical things in designing a really good architecture that's gonna drive transformation or business performance improvements in our client. And the biggest problem we have in technology is there's often a mismatch between the business's needs and the actual technology needs. In fact, 70% of all technology projects actually fail to provide any value. And it's usually because there's a misalignment because between the business architecture and the technology architecture. So let's talk about what is business architecture. Business architecture for the most part is going to be how the organization operates. So, so let's talk about what really goes into that. In a business architecture, you'll typically see the business strategy and its objectives. So you'll be looking at the business's long-term vision, the business's mission, the business's goals, and you'll be looking at all the organization's most strategic initiatives. And you typically will be mapping these things out, especially as an enterprise architect. And you'll be doing constantly, if they say a management and strategy consultant. Now, the next part of the business architecture is really going to be about the business's capabilities. So we have to define the business's capabilities. And this is realistically speaking, what an organization can do to achieve its strategic objectives. And it's going to define what the business does and uh, how the business does it, which is its processes. And it's going to be who does it, which is going to be your organizational structure. So here we're really evaluating the business. We're looking at what it can actually do and can it actually get to its strategic objectives, for example. And if not, what do we need to do to make it get to those strategic objectives? The next part typically of a normal business architecture, and these all vary a little bit, is the types of capabilities of the organization. So what's the organization's core capabilities? What is that organization's big product, competitive advantage? What is it about that organization that makes it great? What's the core business that's supporting the majority of what they're doing? We also have to understand what are the business's supporting capabilities. So there, there are things necessary behind the scenes to get the main things to happen. So we have to map those out because we may want to produce say more widgets, if you, for, for example. But if we don't have the stuff behind the scenes to produce the widgets, it doesn't matter how many widgets our salespeople can sell or that we'd like to produce because we can't do it. And then we really need to typically map out the strategic capabilities of the company. And that's going to be critical for any technology architectures because we want our technology architectures to adapt and grow with the business, uh, to make that business more agile. And uh, we, and if we understand the strategic capabilities of the business and what they're capable of doing and where they want to go, now we can make sure the technology maps to that. So we need to understand the organization's strategic capabilities that are aligned with their long-term goals and understand what's required required for them to execute the business strategy effectively. Okay, so what are the components of business capabilities? Well, people, the organization's people is probably its most valuable resource. So it's people, their skills, their expertise, and the roles that are needed to make that business do what it needs to do. Now, then there's the process, which is how people do things. So typically speaking, there's going to be a lot of work we do on the process side when we're actually looking at business architectures because the way people work is a key component to them actually being able to achieve. Because if you have 100,000 people and they all did it their own way, some people will be doing great, some people will not. But what if we can find the perfect way, the best way that the, the one person that was most efficient figured it out and have the rest of us do it that way? That's why we're gonna be tuning processes along the way. And of course, technology is that other component. If we have the best people and they're doing it the best way and they have the best technology to support them, well, that's when the magic happens. So that's really what we're dealing with. And of course, information and other things and data and insights are gonna be part of it. Now. Another component you may see in a business architecture is going to be something called a value stream. And that's going to represent the end and flow of activities that are going to be required to deliver value to customers or stakeholders. So how does the business produce its whatever? What is it that it does to the customers that gives the customer something good? And how does that uh, come back and help the stakeholders of the business? Uh, so there's that. So we, have to, we also have to focus on what value is delivered and how it's delivered. So is there a way we can deliver more value to our clients, better, faster, and cheaper? Or more value and charge more, but whatever the key is, we're trying to optimize here.
So that's typically what goes on that. So typically we have two kinds of value streams. We have what's called a customer facing, facing value stream, which is everything that's done directly to the customer. So think sales, uh, uh, typically speaking. Now we also have something that supports our value streams and that's gonna be the other type of value stream. So that's gonna be all the stuff behind the scenes, uh, all those internal services. So for example, if I'm selling software, and it's hosted on our cloud. There's going to be behind, and it's like a software as a service product. There's going to be people running that stuff behind the scenes on our private cloud, our data center, public cloud. They are support people. The business can't operate without them. So we need to understand those support value streams too. Now, another key component of uh, of a business architecture is going to be the organizational structure, the org chart. You know, who's in charge? Oh, who's the board? Oh, how, how does it look? That kind of thing. Who are the leaders? Now, I briefly talked about processes and workflows. Well, you know, this is going to be a key component. Uh, part of it, you know, that is going to be looking at the way people work, mapping out the best way for them to work, and trying to find a way to map out the best way for people to work to make the changes that organization needs to change. So if that organization wants to do something different, they have, may have to change the way they do things, and then we need to technology to support them. So that's really why we're gonna be mapping out these workflows. Because we can't just add technology and not know how people work, because we can easily break things. So we need to understand what will trigger a process, uh, the tasks that are along the process, the people that need to be involved in a process. If there is a process, where are the decision points along the way? What kind of inputs and outputs do we have? What kind of tools or systems are necessary to do the job? That's the kind of component that goes into a process or a workflow. We typically also will define some type of an operating model in a business architecture. And realistically speaking, there's four kinds of operating models and I'll kind of explain what they are. There's what you call the coordination model, where you have multiple business units and they operate very independently, but they can also share information and resources for coordinated outcomes. You know, lots of businesses do this. I typically think of a company like Disney, and here's the reason I think of Disney. They've got uh, streaming services, they've got movie studios, they've got a theme park. There ain't a lot of them, but they're all kind of independent. But you may notice there's a new Disney movie and all of a sudden there's a ride at a new Disney thing. So that's how they can kind of coordinate but still operate independently. Now, the next model for businesses to use is something called a unification model. And that's typically where they come up with a very standardized process, standardized systems across the entire group world or every place. And why do they do that? They need consistency, they need quality, and they need uh, the efficiency. So when I typically think of a company that's using a unification model, I think of a McDonald's because they've got very standardized processes. And that's why you can walk into a McDonald's in New York and San Francisco and Miami and Chicago and Dallas, Houston, and get the same Big Mac that looks almost the same, almost identical, the same fries and the same Coke and the same cups, and it feels the same. No, but that works well for a company that needs a uh, highly, uh, highly accurate things. Now, some businesses would do better with a diversification model. At one point in my life, GE was in about, it felt like in every business known to man. They were sending people to space. They were creating trains. They had healthcare things. They were creating home appliances. And that's typically what you would see in a diversification model where you've got independent business units and each one has their own processes and their own systems. So that's a typical type of a diversification model. And then there's the last of the models called the replication model. And that's typically where we have a very standardized process and we typically replicate systems, but they're almost semi-autonomous business units. So, you know, I think of Marriott here. Because whatever, whatever Marriott brand you're in, for the most part, like a Ritz-Carlton, for example, or a Fairfield, or a Courtyard by Marriott, they all kind of look the same when you go in them. But each hotel kind of has local management. And uh, so they're, they could be locally owned, they could potentially be locally managed, and at the same time, they're using standardized systems and standardized processes. So we could have different owners of two different Marriott's and you still won't know. So that's an example of the replication model. Now, one of the other things we're gonna put, probably the last part that I would tell you that I would add into business architecture are really how we process change. So anytime a change needs to occur in the business, uh, how can the change be initiated? Who can uh, perform an impact analysis of the types of changes that need to occur? 
and uh, what is the process to make a change, to, uh, evaluate a change, what have you. So we do a lot of uh, coordination and change management uh, processes uh, as enterprise architects. So now you know from the perspective of an architect, uh, the two architectures, your technology architecture, which is your technology blueprint, and your business architecture, which is your business blueprint, you marry them and align them and you've got some serious magic. So now you know why that's so important for the enterprise architect because it's our job. But honestly, for a cloud architect or an AI architect or a network architect, their job is still to optimize business outcomes. And if they don't understand the business architecture, adding technology can just can can either help or cause harm and you don't know. But the only way you'll know to get it right, and it's wrong 70% of the time, according to McKinsey estimates, is to align the business architecture and technology architecture. That's why architects like a cloud architect or an enterprise architect or executive, that's why we we need so much business acumen and uh, that's why we can't be hands-on because we need to focus on all these things and there's a lot of moving parts here if you'd love to become an enterprise architect and i can tell you after 25 years in this business i absolutely love it i have a free webinar where we'll talk about enterprise architecture talk about the, all the skills you need and how you can get hired sign up the link for this webinar is completely is in the description of this video and of course it's free if you've enjoyed this video please give it a like subscribe and hit the bell to our me notified of new videos to help you in your architecture career, whether it's a cloud architect, enterprise architect, security architect, solutions architect, network architect, or any other type of architect. This is Mike Gibbs signing off for now, and I look forward to seeing you in another video. Take care.